All right, Mike, if you want to uh, kick us sure. off here, twelve yeah. two. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure other people will continue trickling in um, over the next few minutes as well. But uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. This is um, a great collaboration between LHSC Green Team and the London Environmental Network. And so Jamie will be talking or introducing herself in a minute. But uh, she's from London Environmental Network, and she's put together this great slideshow on sustainability at home. So enjoy and uh, use the chat function. Or the are we using the Q and A as well, Jamie? We can, whatever works for people, yeah, honestly. Yeah. So yeah, we can yeah. use the chat and Q&A for any questions. Um, and we'll try and answer everything at the end, I presume. Um, and then anything that goes over time, we'll be kicking around a little while as well, so we can keep talking past one o'clock if needed. And then subsequent to that, you know, email myself, uh, the LHSC green team or Jamie, and we can try and uh, get your questions answered. Of okay, course. thanks, Jamie. So all yours. Thank you so much, Mike. Lovely introduction. And thanks everyone for joining today. I'm very excited to be here or E here because we're not in person. Um, but I hope you all get to learn something new today and to take something back to your homes and families. Um, I will just get moving with a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, so first, I'm just going to do an introduction of myself, the London Environmental Network. Um, and do a little bit of an overview. And then I would like to talk a bit about what sustainability means to you in practice, um, in the real world, you know, have a little bit of a conversation around that. Then we're gonna cover some of the fundamentals around water conservation, energy conservation, and waste management. Um, we're gonna end off on green space best practices as it is my favorite topic. So hopefully you'll see that sparkling through a little bit. Um, but if you guys do have any questions throughout please feel free to pop in the chat. We will come back to them at the end there. Um, you can talk about any of these topics for days. So I'll do my best to sprinkle in a little bit of information for you, but we can talk about it in the Q&A after, or if you want to email Mike or I as well, we are happy to keep the conversation going. Now, briefly, I just want to talk about our um, land acknowledgement and dedication to land reconciliation. So the London Environmental Network does recognize the three downriver First Nations communities, also known as, as Deshka and Sibi. Um, so the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation. Um, we strive to work with these communities and continue to listen and learn uh, with, with what they have to offer to restore um, our natural areas back to its original beauty. Um, we really want to help all communities become climate resilient, and that does involve leaving no one behind. Now, a little bit about me um, to tell you about who this person behind your screen is. Uh, hi, I'm Jamie Dardarian. I am the Greener Homes London Program Manager here at the Environment, London Environmental Network. Um, so that means I work on the residential and um, individual kind of sustainability day to day in London. Um, I have a passion for pretty well all things environment, whether that be conservation, waste reduction, and the opportunities in waste, uh, water conservation, and I do truly just love all the things in our outdoor world and all the species in it, it's amazing. And I think it needs to be protected. Um, I am particularly particularly interested in exploring the gap um, between social inequities and environmentalism and sustainability. And I also am interested um, in working on the cascading impacts of climate change and how that all connects um, and how we can become more resilient as a society. Now, I am a more recent transplant. I moved to London about two years ago from Waterloo Region. Um, I am a self-proclaimed crazy plant lady, if you can't tell from the plants behind me. And I've become a cat mom over the past year, so a little bit about me. Um, hope you enjoy it. Now, the London Environmental Network, we are a organization that was started to build a true network with local environmental organizations, nonprofits, um, passion projects to work on bringing stronger internal capacity and like a stronger and more resilient environmental sector in London. We also have a bunch of our own programs geared towards improving sustainability and environmentalism in different areas. So Greater Homes London is a residential program, but Green Economy London is for businesses. Um, we have environmental action incubators where we fund small passion projects and really so much more. So check out our website if you are interested in learning more there. Now here are just a couple of our member organizations. So we work to bring uh, increased capacity and commitment across these organizations. 
but we do also cross post all their events. So if you are ever interested in getting involved in the environmental sector, you know, you know whether you want to get your hands dirty or get more involved in policy, you can check out um, our member directory or our events page to see it kind of all under one roof there. Now, before we get started, I would love for everyone to just take a minute and think, you're welcome to put it in the chat as well, but I, I won't be able to see it at this time. Um, but just take a moment to think of what sustainability looks like to you. Is it a point we reach? Is it an intersection? You know, is it, a th is it being vegan? What is sustainability and what does it look like to you? And I'm just gonna give you guys a couple of seconds to reflect. All right, I hope you guys have an idea in your head. If not, we'll learn together. So sustainability by the books simply means just meeting our own needs without compromising the needs of future generations, um, or in, in simpler layman's terms, leaving the world in a better place than we found it. Um, kind of like leave no trace when you're camping, very similar idea there. Um, and it kind of focuses around the idea that as humans, as a species, we cannot continue at the pace that we're going at, economic, industrial development, you know, it all functions on the idea that we have um, endless resources, which in fact we do not. So not only are we going to start to run out of resources, we're also absolutely destroying ecosystems in, in as we do it. Um, now, I promise this is as doom and gloom as I'm going to get it um, throughout this presentation. I will try to keep it on the happier side, but it's important to note we are doing true damage. Um, we do need to change our ways. We need a systems overhaul um, and we can do it. We can put thought and time and money into changing supply chains and businesses and we can build back better than what we're working with now. Now, in practice, um, we see sustainability sustainability translated to so many different things. Um, a lot of times it's consumerism, you know, being green and sustainable, but in the industry, it's mostly done through data collection. So waste conversion rates, carbon output rates, biodiversity, looking at land and species conservation, green and gray infrastructure, um, electricity and natural gas usage rates, and so much more. But day by day, it often looks much different. So it might look like leading by example, um, trying to reduce your carbon usage or your water usage. It may be that you encourage policy dis discussion at you know, a local municipal level or at the national federal level to work towards our climate goals as a country. Maybe it's shopping locally, maybe you plant native community cleanups, whatever it is, it's also important and it all factors into what we consider sustainability as. So in conclusion, from our little behind the scenes of um, the theory of sustainability, I just wanna to touch on a couple points. So sustainability, it's not a one size fits all. Um, you really have to look at the metrics systems, you know, available reporting that businesses and organizations have on it. Um, and as well on an individual level, I do wanna say perfection is the enemy of good. And I kind of live by that saying, because Nobody's perfect, but just because we're not perfect, it doesn't mean that our impacts aren't valid or we're not growing towards something greater as a group. Um, now, transforming to a more sustainable society, zero waste, whatever it may be, we all are going to have to come together and make some changes, but it's very possible and it's important that we keep our eyes on the future ahead there. Um, and just a couple closing points before we move on to our next session. Se section, sorry, it's Friday, I'm struggling to speak. Um, so the most sustainable solution is the one that you already have. 99% of the case, that is true. Um, you've already used the resources to create it and get it to your door. And if it's perfectly functioning and A-OK, -okay, why scrap it just so it can go to a landfill to replace it with something that took more resources and so on and so forth. Um, secondly, as I've said, every action makes a difference. Individuals coming together is, has such an impact that we can't even really fathom often. Um, the group is there behind the scenes, even if you feel like you're the one doing all the heavy lifting. And finally, sustainable improvements, they're not a privilege everyone has access to. A lot of the times they require a lot of funding, a lot of financing, um, and you have to be able to have those you know, financial privileges to make those early adoption transitions into a more sustainable lifestyles. So it's important to note that while being sustainable is great, it's not something everyone can feasibly do day to day. All right, now we get to move into the practical. We're done being in the classroom. Let's talk about what you can do to conserve water in your own home. But before we get into what we can do, 
let's talk about why we do it. Because when we're talking about conserving a, a renewable and natural resource, it sounds kind of silly. Um, and it's, I'm gonna steer you towards two points. The first being the graph on the left there. Um, I'll use my little mouse here to show you that in Canada, we use the third most water per capita out of every country in the world. That's embarrassing, I find. And I think we can do a whole lot better. There's so much room for improvement. Even if you look across the seas to Europe, um, there's really so much more we can be doing to improve our water conservation or water um, quality even as well. And then secondly, I would want you to look at this on the right here. Um, this graph just outlines what water we're actually working with. Cause you know, when you look at Earth from space we have so much water, but we have very limited water we can actually work with. So around 2.5% is actually fresh water that we can use. 80% of that 2.5% is stuck in ice and glaciers, not very accessible. Same with groundwater, also not very accessible. It leaves us around 1% of the 2.5% of total fresh water that we have for drinking water and keeping us humans alive. That's not very much when you're looking at the whole scale of things. So it's important to remember um, we really need to value the drinking water and the clean water that we have, and we need to work to keep it that way. All right, so some fun, easy ways you can conserve water in your own home. First being faucet aerators. Um, they're great if you don't have a low flow uh, water faucet because they just screw onto the end. They're rather cheap, five to $10 each. And how they work is they introduce oxygen into your water to maintain the flow and the pressure while reducing the amount of water you're actually using. Um, and low flow shower heads as over here, they're very similar except in like the shower head version of it. So they introduce oxygen to offset the amount of water you're using while maintaining pressure and flow of the uh, shower head. Um, now, if you are a renter, you can always get the shower heads and aerators that you can take with you when you move. So you don't have to leave them there. Um, and then if you have outdoor space, using a rain barrel to catch rainwater coming down the roof, it's there anyways, you might as well use it for something. So if you're doing outdoor gardening and whatnot, it's great to have one of those around to just supply you with some uh, local rainwater. Now, when you're looking at appliances, there are two main logos you wanna look for. The first being WaterSense, the second being Energy Star. Um, those are standardized programs built for consumers that evaluate all the models on the market. So their goal is to standardize what is efficient and what not and make it really easy for you as a consumer to purchase the best models, you know, have the knowledge you need to make your purchasing decisions. So keep an eye out for those when you're looking for new appliances when the time comes around. And then secondly, you can DIY a low flow toilet so easily. All you need is an old container. You can fill it with water, a couple rocks if it's not heavy enough. Um, you do just place it in your toilet basin here and uh, Bob's your uncle, you got a low flow toilet. Um, so how it works is it displaces some of the water that would be in the toilet basin there. And then um, your toilet really just functions as normally. So instead of having to go out and buy a low flow toilet, you can have one for free. All right, and another big area of water conservation is actually ensuring we're not having floods. Now, particularly I'm talking floods um, from your water rather than outside water leaking in. And that's just because they have the ability to not only destroy your home, um, but also they leak a ton of water right under your nose without you even noticing a lot of the time. So I have this statistic in here, you know, a steady leak of 1 16th of an inch, which is teeny tiny, can waste almost 400 gallons of water a day, which is incredible. Honestly, it kind of blew my mind when I learned that. Um, but it goes to show that these little, little actions can have an impact, both bad and good. Um, so by checking for like mold and mildew, water spots, listening for toilets running, faucet stripping, all of that can actually help you reduce your water usage day to day. And then finally, you just want to be keeping your pipes in good health as best as possible. So that includes not putting things down them that shouldn't go down them. So makeup wipes, um, hair, food. <laughs> feminine hygiene products, but also fat oil and creases, such as olive oil, coconut oil. Um, they clog your drains right up and will cause you a lot of money and uh, headaches. Another good thing to do is to search before you pour your pharmaceuticals down the drain. Just search up to see um, what like the lifetime or the half-life is of them and if it will impact. Um, they can sometimes hang around in our waterways a lot longer than we want them to. So being cautious of how you dispose of your pharmaceuticals and 
unused medication can be um, quite valuable to the local ecosystem. And then as well, these fat oil and grease cups, there's a picture for them here. Um, they're available at any London public library. So you can get them for free um, and then you put your fats, oils and greases in them. The cool thing about them is you can either put them in your garbage or if you take them to an enviro center, they will turn them into a green biofuel and use them to fuel London. So you can contribute back to the grid with your waste in that case. And it's super neat initiative they've started. All right, let's switch gears slightly talking about energy efficiency. I'm giving you guys a crash course today, so we can't hang around anywhere too long, but hopefully we'll get you some more tips here. Um, again, we're gonna start by saying, why is it important to conserve energy? And I hope you guys are seeing a trend here because once again, Canada won the top in the world for energy usage. So we use a ton of water, we use a ton of energy, and we really don't need to be. There's so much opportunity for advancement there. Um, something to consider as well is when you're talking about what fuels Ontario's electricity grid, we have a ton of different sources. So not all of them bad. We are working on improving our renewable energies, um, but we still have, you know, 10% natural gas and we use a lot of nuclear energy, which does have some associated environmental impacts with it. So it's important to be cautious of, you know, what's fueling our grid and trying to not use it as heavily um, where possible because that as a result reduces the amount of carbon we're outputting and all that kind of good fun stuff. All right, so a couple really easy swaps for you. Um, replacing your light bulbs with LED light bulbs can reduce your energy usage for lights by around 75%, which is just incredible. Um, now this is compared to traditional hydrogen or incandescent lighting. And again, like we said earlier, you wanna use what you've got. So use what you've got light bulb wise and then transitioning over to LEDs is the way to go there. I'm just gonna throw in the Energy Star logo again when you're looking for lighting, appliances, anything to that nature, keep an eye out for it. An easy way to know you're making a smart decision regarding the efficiency of your products. Additionally, whenever you can use electricity at off peak hours, can help us manage our fossil fuel usage and it also offers you cheaper rates. Um, so it's something to be mindful of and cautious when you can to try to work around those peak hours. Um, and then I'll save your money too. So best of both worlds. And then finally, air sealing is something really easy that you can DIY as a homeowner or a renter if you are having extensive problems. Um, now you can air seal on windows, doors, cracks, seams like in your foundation or um, around your windows, um, you can do around outlets and light switches and all of these um, air sealing around these areas is to help make your home more airtight and as a result, more energy efficient because you're putting less energy into heating and cooling the outside rather than your actual house. So that's usually done with, you know, foam, foam ceiling strips or foam inserts, um, caulking or putty, anything like that that can seal up. Um, there are tons of resources online. We even have a couple on our website on how you can do it, but a great preliminary step that you can do on your own without much building experience. And then of course, when talking energy conservation, we gotta talk about the big guns behind it all. So uh, solar is a big one, you know, create your own energy, divest from the grid, clean energy source. Um, in some areas, you can actually contribute back to the grid for credits. Um, financial credit. So that can be really fun. You not only save money, but you're also reimbursed for the energy you're creating. Um, electric vehicles, obviously another big one, you're going to reduce your carbon super substantially because you're switching to EV or at least partial EV. Um, and then insulation, that should be a preliminary first step if you are looking into retrofitting your home. Again, we don't want to be putting all that energy into heating the outside of our home. We want to keep that heating and cooling inside of our home. And that is one of the ways you improve the building envelope. So generally, our safety today in the attic is standard. If you've got less than 10 inches, 10 inches of any kind of insulation, um, you should look at having that topped up or retrofitted when you can as that will not only lead to a more comfortable home, more cost-effective home, but it also will make your home more energy efficient. And then finally, the air source heat pump. So this is a home heating and cooling um, equipment, piece of equipment. 
that functions as both an AC and furnace. It is fully electric, so you're getting off carbon there. Um, now, something to note with the heat pumps is they do require a backup heating source because in, Can or in Canada, we have Canadian winters, it gets really cold. So making sure that um, you have another source of heating when it's not efficient to run is important. Um, just to make sure that you're keeping your efficiencies as good as possible, but also that you're not wasting a ton of money there. Now, everything I've just mentioned here is eligible for some grants um, through like different source of grants. So we can talk a bit, a bit about those in the next slide here. So if you are looking to do any substantial home retrofitting, it's a really good time to get into it right now um, because there's lots of financial programs out there for you. So there's the Canada Greener Homes Grant, which is up to $5,000. Now, both the Canada Greener Homes and the Home Efficiency Rebate Plus offer the retrofits for your home retrofits. So whether that be windows, doors, air sealing, insulation, uh, space heating, water heating, solar, anything like that is eligible under these programs. So you can get a good chunk back. Um, they do require energy assessments, although you can be reimbursed up to $600 for the cost of those. And there's just a couple criteria to meet to be eligible for these programs. Most of the time it's, you know, you own the home, it's your primary residence, it's not a multi-use residence building, um, things to that nature. And then for the Enbridge one, it's bonus rebate. So if you're an Enbridge customer that uses Enbridge for space heating, you're eligible for that program there. Um, and then finally, it's the federal incentive for zero emission vehicles. That one's up to $5,000 for EVs that meet their requirements. And then for the um, Canada Reader Homes interest-free loan program, that's a really good program if you need to make the retrofits or, or uh, the renovations sooner than later, but may not have access to the financing up front. It is interest-free and you have a 10-year payback period, so it gives you some time and flexibility there. All right, waste management. Exciting. We're on to the next one. So as per usual, we're gonna start about why it matters. So I have pulled this um, graph from the Canadian governmental website regarding our residential waste breakdown, which is most often done through a waste audit, standardized waste audit. Um, and I would love for you guys all just to think in the back of your heads, what you notice, what are some trends with the types of waste we're seeing? What kind of waste are we seeing the most of? There's a lot of them, but what I certainly noticed is the amount of organic products that are going right into our waste to so like the food, the paper, the textiles, even the yard and garden waste, that all doesn't need to be in our garbage. Yet it is taken up many percentages on our graphs. So that tells me that we have room to improve our um, waste management systems and how we consider what we use day to day as well. So in waste management, it often starts where the problem begins, which is when you're shopping for the products. Um, now, a lot of the time it is focused around, you know, stop over shopping for products when you don't need to, like avoiding the impulse purchasing or, you know, the sale products. And I get it. I am just as guilty as anyone else. I love a good sale in the grocery store. But by trying to limit what you're purchasing when you don't need to can ideally help limit what you're throwing out at the end of the day by having too much, letting it expire, forgetting about it for six years, and then you have to throw it out, things like that. Um, it is sometimes tricky to try to stop impulse shopping. So you can ask yourself, you know, what do I need this for? What need will this fill for me? Um, another fun thing you can do is just try to have a little challenge with yourself to see how long you can go without needing to grocery shop. So if you are someone who stockpiles stuff like me, I've done this, it's just see, maybe you can go a day, maybe you can go a week, maybe you can go a month without going to the grocery store um, to pick up food items for your meals, just to kind of reduce the amount you've got hanging out in your cupboards back there. And then finally, um, trying to avoid packaging and plastics where possible. Um, plastics generally are the ones we want to avoid as cardboard is generally more recyclable. Um, now I know we're getting rid of the plastic bags. So reusable produce bags are another great way to avoid plastics. Um, but don't sweat every piece of plastic because it is important to note that for some products like the cucumbers you get, they ship a lot better and they hold a lot longer when they're in plastic. So it's one of those sustainability where you have to pick and choose, you know, do you sport the plastic or 
or you're going to support an industry that has a lot more food going right into the garbage because it couldn't get there because there's plastic, no plastic on it. So lots of decisions, but trying to be cautious of what you're purchasing can be helpful. Additionally, now please don't go off in the chats. I know we don't have a green bin program yet. We are working on it. Unfortunately, I am not the city, so I cannot tell you when it's going to happen. Um, but we can talk about the value that will bring um, in the fact that we'll be able to divest so much waste from landfill to turn into soil that we can use again and again. It's a really great program and I'm very excited to see it happening sooner than later. Um, I do just want to touch on some things that you may think can go in green bids that actually cannot as that will help save um, some of the contaminated bins from ending up in landfill instead of going into the composting stream. So for things like cotton swabs, hair and fur, wood-based items, chopsticks, um, and biodegradable plastics, they are not fitted for traditional green bin use. And that's because they often require, especially for the biodegradable plastics, they require you know, certain heating, certain settings, a very specific type of settings and uh, environment to break down correctly. And that often just isn't achievable day to day in what we're using as our residential municipal waste uh, green bin recycling program. All right, and because obviously the Green Wind program's not here, what are we gonna do in the meantime? We have answers for you. Um, so there's a couple of different options for you depending on how keen you are to start green binning. Obviously, if you've got the room in your backyard and you can have a composting unit, great. Um, although for a lot of city living folks, so those in apartment buildings, that's not necessarily as feasible. So I'll touch on a couple of points here. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard, but they offer countertop composting units, such as this one here. Um, they can be kind of expensive, like two to $400. So this is for those who are more keen on getting into the green bidding world. Um, how it works is you fill it up, it chops it up, heats it up and grinds it into kind of like a peat type um, soil that can be used for your plants and whatnot. I've heard they're effective, pretty quiet, and they don't stink. So if you are interested in having something to manage your waste, that could be a good little countertop option for you. Otherwise, you can support our local systems. So one being Urban Roots London. They are an organization that grows um, produce, local fresh produce for, you know, for giving away to community groups or for uh, like extremely low cost options for folks just to provide fresh produce locally. So they're a great organization they have a community compost plot. So you can take your compost out to them and they will gladly accept it and use it in their farming operations. Additionally, they do have a share waste app out there um, that you can download. Maybe you don't live near Urban Roots. It is over near Hamilton Road. So you could try this share waste app to collect, you know, you with the waste to people who are looking for waste, like huge gardeners or farming operations, just so you can actually do something with that waste rather than it ending up in our landfill where things cannot break down as well. They're not ideal conditions. You tend to produce more methane in landfills, all that not so good stuff. Additionally, when we're talking about waste, we do wanna be sorting our waste properly. Um, and that's just because it's an industry like everything else in the world, meaning time is money and money is time. So. A lot of the times if they're seeing, you know, recyclables that aren't washed out and everything with a lid on it and things just not as they should be, they can actually just toss it, put it inside the landfill. It's too contaminated. They don't have time for it. And then all that hard work you put in is useless. Um, this is also highly associated with the idea of wish cycling. If you guys have ever heard that, it's the idea that, um, when you wish for something to be recycled, like that coffee cup lid, it's got the recycling sign on it. It's plastic, it can be recycled, so you toss it in, but in fact, it's not. And we just wished our way into that recycling bin. Um, and that can, if they don't have time for it, they might just toss that whole load into the landfill stream. Um, and it's really just not ideal to um, keeping our waste streams as sorted and ready to go as, as much as possible so we can actually recycle them as we intended to. Um, for knowing what goes where, it's really based on where you live specifically. It's not a one size fit all. So to find out what's accepted in your local municipality, um, you can check online on the websites. A Recycle Coach app is really good for finding out what goes where. Um, they usually have information online for your municipality on what they accept, but worst comes to worst, you can just call them. Um, like if you're in London, call the city of London to see if they accept it or not before you just 
dump it all in the recycling bin. All right, we're getting there. Now the fun part. Um, this is for me where the waste management and finding value in our waste and just supporting ecosystems and creating positive outdoor environments for many species all comes into play. So I hope you guys have fun with this one with me. First things first, I would like to start with invasive species because this is a bit of a hot topic for some folks, especially given most greenhouses and plant sellers don't generally mark plants as invasive or native. So it can be really tough to tell as a consumer um, what you're buying and what you do with it. So I generally recommend looking up native plant lists or doing a little bit of research beforehand. If you're not that kind of person, the least or the easiest next step would be to either use your phone to do some Googling on the type of plant it is um, and what it's best suited for. So if a plant is invasive, like mint even, um, you really wanna avoid planting it directly in your garden beds or in your on your property. Um, they got creepy crawlers that'll go underground and you'll be chasing them out of your yard for like 20 years. It'll be a giant pain. Save yourself the trouble, put it in a pot or a planter box or something that can keep them constrained and that you can kind of keep an eye on yourself. And as well, you do want to avoid putting them near forested and naturalized areas, especially in the areas that don't have people watching over them constantly, kind of being those land stewards, um, is that's the perfect opportunity for invasives to be introduced to our native landscape and kind of take over before anyone else has a chance to notice or do anything about it. Um, and just another thing to note here is you, when you're getting rid of, especially invasives, but any plants really, you don't want to be throwing them into naturalized areas, um, kind of for the same reason I just mentioned. We don't want them taking off and impacting what little functioning ecosystems we have left. But what can you do with the stuff you're done with outside? Well, plenty. If you have plants, um, I would check if they're perennials or annuals, if they're gonna last more years, see if you can pot them up, save them for another year, or see if your friends or someone in the buy nothing group on Facebook wants them. They're perfectly good. You don't have to toss them in the bin just because you're done with them. Might as well give someone else a turn with the plants. Um, as well, if you are collecting pots like most of us do, you can reuse them. Same with soil. If you have healthy plants, you can reuse the soil. Um, if you got like pests or root rot or anything, I wouldn't recommend reusing soil in that case. Um, for the pots you're collecting, yeah, you can reuse them or you can often donate them. So again, um, on the Buy Nothing groups on Facebook or a lot of times nurseries will collect them as well for reuse at later time. Um, if you're getting rid of a large amount of soil, there's a couple key points here. You really want to ensure your soil is dried out well, and that's just because it is really heavy when it's wet. Um, a lot of the municipal waste trucks have a weight limit of around 200, 250 pounds for the big bins. So if you've got, you know, a couple feet of soil that can easily take up the weight allotment for your garbage. Um, so to prevent it not being collected and it being a giant pain for you, just make sure it's dried really well before you're getting rid of it or you can spread it out across your lawn and just kind of blend it all in as so, um, and then life goes on as it normally would. Please do not dump soil and plants, but soil as well in naturalized areas. And that is because seed pods like burdock, they can hang for 60 to 80 years. So you could be the cause of a new invasive species outbreak and not even be around to see it. Like you wouldn't even know it's happening, but you could be doing it. So just by not, putting stuff out there, even though, you know, it's natural, it should break down by not putting it out there to begin with, you can prevent it happening altogether for as much as possible. And then opportunities in the garden, so many. So you can really um, make a lot out of your garbage. So a fun little activity you can do if you have kids or grandkids, take some tins and poke some holes in the bottom, and then you can paint them and pot little plants in them. They turn out really cute, honestly, I would recommend it if you're looking for something to do. And then if you are starting any kind of seedlings, if you have water bottles, egg containers, fruit containers, other clear plastics, anything like that, you can make mini greenhouses and they work excellently. That photo in the middle is from a mini greenhouse I made for some native plants last year. Worked perfectly, very easy, would highly recommend. Additionally, you can also use cardboard as long as there's no like plastic on it because that will obviously not break down. You can lay it over, you know, grass and weedy areas. If you're looking to expand your garden, um, you would just put down the cardboard, a layer of mulch. It's recommended to do it around the fall or winter time because it does take eight to 12 months to break down. So you want to not be redigging it up in the spring there. 
And then also another fun project if you're looking to get your gardening off the ground for um, not a million dollars <laughs> is they actually you can make raised planters out of old filing cabinets so this is this picture here there are just old filing cabinets on their side with the um drawers taken out of them a couple holes drilled in the bottom perfect raised garden bed planters instead of them being hundreds of dollars you can you can make your own with something that would have ended up in the landfill additionally if you're making the raised garden bed planters um they're, they're deep, right? So a lot of times people will fill them with topsoil, but it can be rather expensive. Um, and it's quite a pain too, it's heavy stuff. So you can put things that would naturally break down like leaf litter, sticks and twigs. Um, you could even use like newspaper and cardboard if you wanted and put that in the bottom like third to a half of your waste garden bed planters to reduce the weight in them, to continue adding nutrients into the soil, um, but to also limit how much of that topsoil you'll need to put into them. If you are really keen on getting a greenhouse, great news, you can DIY your own. If you collect a whole bunch of old windows around the community, frame them up, you can make yourself a summer greenhouse rather easily. If you have a little bit of building experience, it'll go a long way for that one. And then finally, if you have the large plastic juice bottles or milk jugs or anything like that, as in this picture here, they make phenomenal vertical gardens. So if you want the creepy crawlers, the strawberries, tomatoes, things to that nature, they do really, really well in these vertical planters. So something very easy you could try out on your own there. And then as well, just working towards that backyard ecosystem. So the, the quality so that we're looking to attract to um, prevent having to use as many pesticides and fertilizers and all that unnatural stuff. Um, so by composting, you're going to create your own very nutrient dense soil for use in your gardens. Rain barrels, as we've talked about, will prevent you just from having to use as much water day to day. Um, having a bug hotel or multiple to promote native species in your yard can be great because they can a lot of times actually help manage the invasive insects, such as like the thrifts and aphids and white flies. The ones that can be a real problem in your gardens. Um, so you can actually kind of try to manage that naturally and it can be rather successfully when done right. And additionally, like birdhouses, owl, owl houses, um, bat hotels, any of those kind of homes for animals can be really great um, because again, they naturally manage insect populations so they can get your backyard into less of a buggy wonderland for you. All right, and then lastly, I did just want to touch on befriending the birds as birds are all around. We often love them, but what can we do to make sure we are keeping them happy and healthy? Um, a big problem for birds these days is actually our cats. Um, they're really good hunters. They're quick little guys and they do catch birds when they're outside. So having your cat on a leash or kept indoors or if you're feeling bougie, you could build a catio too. They're pretty neat looking, um, but just to prevent the birds from being attacked by the cats, you know, it's a problem. And then as well, when you're feeding your wild, wildlife, like the birds, um, you know, you should look at what kind of species you're getting and do a little bit of research, nothing crazy, but see what kind of feed they should be eating and see if you can introduce that into your feeding regime or um, into the type of feed that you're buying for the birds. As well as another year um, with the bird flus being bad. So please, please make sure you are cleaning your feeders, uh, your bird baths, anything that they are congregating in. Um, you should be cleaning them every couple of weeks at the minimum to help limit the spread of disease um, as it's really killing off birds in, in hordes or flocks, I should say, but it's rather substantially impacting the populations. As well, um, the biggest threat we see to birds is actually our structure. So um, the, reflect, the reflections on our lights and then our lights itself. So um, lights are rather blinding to birds as when they're migrating, they use the stars to navigate. So by having things on motion sensors or on timers can help limit how much light pollution we're producing. And then as well, if you get bird stickers or the bird dots, I'm sure you guys have seen them before, they can work excellently for reducing the amount of birds flying into your windows. Um, they do need to be placed very close together because if it's less than two inches by two inches, a bird thinks it can fit through there. So you gotta really break up that shot or the reflection and break up the space um, and you can help save some birds by doing so. All right. I hope you guys had fun with that. I am happy to talk to anyone about any of those topics anytime really to kind of conclude off for you here. Um, if you want to retrofit your home, need some assistance um, or you want a home energy assessment, we can help you with that. 
If you're looking for more financial assistance, um, whether that be local London programs or on your energy bills, there are like 15 to 20 out there right now. So I couldn't talk about them all today, um, but we can talk about them anytime. Shoot me an email and we'll uh, get you moving on the right track there. If you are looking for more information like what we talked about today, we have sustainability guidebooks available on our website. There are tips, tricks, local information um, where you can go and get your fill of anything you're looking to learn. We have both a renter and a homeowner version available for you. Um, and then as I mentioned before, if you're looking to volunteer, looking to get involved in the environmental sector in London, check out our events page because we cross post for ourselves and around 50 network organizations. So it's a great one stop shop to see how you can get involved. And then finally, if you are looking for other um, organizations to get involved with what they offer and what they can do for you, you can check out our website or email me. So the things like Free Forest London's free tree program, the London Food Bank's free green wall program, we offer uh, free cigarette recycling receptacles. Um, you can get free local produce from Urban Roots London. And really, there's so many more out there. I could talk all day on what different organizations offer in London. So if you are interested in anything I said, please feel free to visit our website or email Mike or myself there. And now we are officially going to open it to the question and answer period. Um, so we can kind of just hop into that there. Yeah. Um, so there's a question from Sue at the start. Uh, what local company organizations do you recommend for doing a home energy audit uh, for recommendations for better insulation, et cetera? All right. So obviously, I'm going to take this as a shameless pitch for ourselves. We offer energy audits. We have for the past year and a half now. Um, we've done around 200 in the past year and a bit. So we can help you out there. Um, really, you'll find there's a couple different companies in London, though, like Energy Wise Consulting. There's us, the London Environmental Network, um, and I believe like Building Knowledge. They're all they're all good. You'll have a rather similar experience throughout. Um, you just tend to see either kind of provincial or national run companies or smaller non for profits in the industry of energy audits. You don't really see a whole lot of the middle ground there. Awesome. And um, I'm sorry, I can actually follow up on the insulation as well. Um, we always recommend net zero insulation. We've worked with them on our community retrofit project, so we can vouch that they do great work um, in removing damaged insulation, air sealing, attic venting, um, and then re-insulating up to that level that you need. Um, so they're a great company if you're looking for great work um, at a reasonable price. Great. Um, so Michelle Levine asked, do you support the use of garburetors for produce uh, matter? And are there any concerns? Yes and no. Like it's obviously going to depend on how it works behind the scenes. So it can be tough for us to talk about it um, because we're not at the municipal recycling or the municipal waste facility. So it will all depend on how they deal with the waste. I mean, generally we're talking about putting a bunch of junk down the drains. Um, so obviously the risks of clogging and whatnot, or just not being educated around what should go down the garburetors. Um, so I personally see opportunities for issues there. Um, there are some places, like some places in the United States that have the capacity in their systems to remove it and, you know, divert it over to like kind of a composting stream, but it really would depend on what we're working with in the municipal facilities for that that kind of yeah. situation. Would you say in London, a garburetor would be a better solution than landfill, but obviously not as good as composting? Well, I would think it would be comparable to the fat oil and grease cups um, because with a garburetor, I mean, you could blend it all up and put it in one of those cups and it's still, they're taken to an anaerobic digester um, where bacteria breaks them down, creates methane, and then we use that for fueling um fueling London so I would personally see like that as the best option like creating yeah like a composting or creating energy out of it as better because it's not just going to the garbage sure okay um so Connie McKenzie asks uh so they have some solar panels but they've found that there aren't many places that are servicing problems that they're having uh does Len have a list of solar panel companies that provide maintenance for older solar panel systems around London you know what I haven't had anyone ask me regarding the maintenance of them um generally we would talk 
about the hater group um, as they're a, a local London company that does like the heat pumps and solar. Um, I imagine they would do um, like servicing on them, but I couldn't say for sure. So Connie, if you want to email me, I can look into that more for you on that one. But yeah, generally we recommend German solar or the, or the hater group um, for anything regarding solar there. Yeah, Connie, I'll also send you another smaller outfit as well that um, you might find beneficial. Okay, so Megan Seaton asked, uh, do you have an opinion on TerraCycle for hard to recycle items? Uh, I don't know what TerraCycle is, so. They're, they're a group, I believe, in London. The name sounds familiar to me. Um, it's hard to have opinions on the recycling because it's really just the type of capacity they have. Um, in London, we receive so much waste from Toronto, so it's really not just our waste that we're dealing with. Um, but personally, I see that as an area that in the future, there is so much opportunity for um, just having that waste and collecting it and breaking it down into something that we can use again is extremely, extremely valuable. So that's really where I personally like to focus on the whole recycling and composting spiel. It's what can we get out of it at the end? Perfect. Okay. Um, Diane Posig asks, how do you get rid of grackle birds? This time of year is really bad. We actually just put up a bird feeder this week and all last night and this morning, grackle birds eating all yeah. of our feed. They do, they do <laughs> flocks. I don't know if there is any um, like kind way to deal with them other than taking down the feeder for a bit. I mean, I've had them at our feeders as well. Um, there are some hot takes on feeding birds this time of year, which I've learned more recently. So um, some people in the bird industry do believe that we shouldn't be feeding this early to promote birds to be looking for insects to feed their young, which is extremely valid. Um, but if you are having problems around the feeder, yeah, I would just leave it empty for a day or two. It worked rather flawlessly for me. Um, anything past that would be maybe changing the type of feeder you have, maybe getting one that doesn't allow for as big of a bird to go on it, um, or searching up if they have like specific deterrents, like smells or like reflective things or things like that, that are not harmful to them, but will also deter them from being there. Great. Okay. Um, Shalini, <clears throat> you're asking about solar panels uh, installation as well, so that we can get back to on that too. Yeah, for solar, if you're in London, um, if, if you search net metering in London, that'll take you to the London Hydro webpage. That is where you should start when you're interested in solar. So um, due to infrastructure limitations for Londoners, it's very hit and miss on if your property is eligible, not for having the solar panels, whether you can connect to the grid with them to like have an, a truly connected system. So you do have to talk to London Hydro first to see if that's even possible. Then that's when you'd look at getting your quotes to see if it's feasible. And then after that, that's when you'd go the whole energy audit, grant or loan program route if you wanted to actually, you know, proceed with installing them on your home. Okay, great. And someone had asked you, can you put up the last slide of the presentation? Marta was asking. Yeah. Go back one. Uh, oh, I'm stuck here. This one, yes. And we can all smile so we can take a nice picture. <laughs> all right. Anybody else with questions? Feel free to pop them in the chat. There are no silly questions. It's what we're here for. But I do hope you guys learned something today. You enjoyed the presentation. Um, you've maybe been inspired to try something new on your home or personal sustainability journey. There is truly so much out there that you can do. It's, uh, it's endless, but it's a lot of fun too. I think a lot of the sustainability and the narrative around it is around, you know, go vegan, zero waste, stop eating everything, stop using everything, but it's not true. A lot of the time, it's just making some changes and being a little more conscientious of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Connie has another question. So any thoughts about methane as a problem with tankless water heaters? Apparently they fire off to warm water and release methane. Hmm. I haven't heard this, but we do. One of our energy auditors is an HVAC contractor. So if you emailed me that question, I could ask an actual HVAC installer and get you a true answer because I don't want to uh, 
lead you the wrong direction there. I don't have quite enough info for that one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, that's interesting. I didn't know what you're referring to would be like a leakage issue. So mm -hmm. where they're actually release, releasing the natural gas, Connie, um, without actually firing it, because that would just turn the methane in the natural gas into CO2. So that's interesting. I haven't heard of that issue specifically. I replaced my gas water heater with a heat pump water heater uh, about two years ago, a year and a half ago now. Um, and then also replaced my gas furnace with a, an electric heat pump. So yeah, doing those things kind of even just eliminates that, but certainly the tankless in theory are the best natural gas ones, but you know, maybe, maybe not anymore if they're, you know, releasing natural gas just straight into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. That's always something we'll have to look into. Yeah, I haven't heard that as well. Like generally a tankless is what a lot of people go with as for the heat pump water heaters. Mike, I'd be interested in hearing your experience because I've, you know, through the grapevine heard that um, they're not always like the easiest to install, like depending on what you've got going and that they can be rather expensive too. So I think like on my side, on the energy audit, we generally see people go towards the tank list rather than the heat pump, just based on what we're working with right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the install, it's definitely a taller unit. So you have to, and you have to be able to do your plumbing. Obviously, if you're paying someone to do it, they can do it. I did it myself, um, but you know, awesome. Uh, I also had the electrical already there where it was going to go. So I didn't have to run any electrical wire. Um, so that kind of worked out conveniently for me, which is where it kind of, you definitely need to bring in an electrician to do that stuff where plumbing, you know, it is sort of a DIY thing that you can do. Um, but yeah, the, the issue that I actually ended up having was that the initial fan that came with it, that uh, on the condenser unit that blows the air through to cool, to pull all the uh remove add heat I guess um, it was actually really loud so it was imbalanced um, and I had to get a replacement for it and then doing that replacement myself was like some horrible nightmare uh, but it worked out I mean at the end of the day it, it works out great now and has it's all electric and I'm not burning any natural gas for it so you get off that grid completely yep and we did have someone comment that um, regarding the whole grapples invading your bird feeders, that safflower seed can be um, a good for reducing the squirrels and grackles as compared to sunflower seeds. I will say if you have squirrels and stuff on your feeders, um, a two liter pop bottle on top of the feeder, like on the string, if you thread it through, works brilliantly for keeping the squirrels off. They can't get around it, so they can't climb down onto the feeders um, if you are having that problem. Uh. Nice. All right. Um, yeah, if you are looking for composting units, the city does sell them for re reasonably cheap. Um, and I believe if you are looking for a rain barrel, if you go to rainbarrel.ca, you can see there is going to be some fundraisers in London over the May long weekend where you can get them for like, I think, 50 to $80. So much less than your um, your where like home hardwares or your warehouse stores and you're supporting a local organization. So rainbarrel.ca if you guys are looking to get one awesome all right all right we'll ask yeah. you to get your last questions in or forever hold your peace <laughs> as we are running out of time a little bit perfect all right guys i think we're uh we're good i don't see any other questions mm. so uh jamie thank you so much to you and london environmental network for putting on this presentation today uh, I think we definitely learned a lot and hopefully we'll have you back again and, you know, we'll do similar sort of sem seminars in the future. Yeah, it was lovely to be here today. Um, I hope you guys can take something home, get a passion project or, or a little seed started in the back of your mind there. Thank you so much for listening and for coming out today. I really appreciate it um, and have a great Friday and weekend, everyone. <laughs>